Welcome to Stories from the Trail. This episode is brought to you by listeners like you. Find out how you can support the show at patreon.com slash stories from the trail. Oh, for a minute, it sounded like me. Oh, we're doing it again. Oh, shoot. I really wanted to know what it sounded like. I know. Well, I'll, I'll play you back the recording later. You can. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll send you just the outtakes. It was like you would start saying something and then it would stretch out. So it'd be like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Like Gary, tell sentence. me you still recorded that so we can oh. make that the start of the episode. Hey. <laughs> Griffin saying, hey. <laughs> yes. Testing, testing. All right, so now let's pretend. Let's pretend that I just picked up the phone and we didn't do any of that other stuff. I just want to make sure that yeah. we're recording. Good. Hey, Griffin, how's good. how's it going, man? Hey, Gary, how are you? I'm doing, doing well. Doing well, thanks. Yeah, long time no see. Yeah, I don't think I've seen you since last time I was in North Carolina. Uh, that was what about two years ago, I think. Three, yeah, two, yeah. 2015. Yeah, two or three years ago, and you were on your way to do something pretty crazy then, too, weren't you? Yeah, I wanted to do a whitewater kayaking kind of like tour of the southeast. Um, so I checked out the Nantahala and um, mm -hmm. did some kayaking on the Ocoee in Tennessee and then swung by West Virginia and ran the new. Um, so that was really fun. And I think you were still pretty new to kayaking at the time, too, weren't you? You were just, like, jumping right into the Class 4, Class 5 stuff. Yeah, I kayaked for about a year and a half at that point, I think. That's pretty impressive. So um, let's just get this out of the way, and then we'll talk about what you're doing. Can you say, uh, just say your name real quick and who you are and how we know each other? Yeah, um, I'm Griff Howard. Uh, I was just until recently a student at Northeastern. Um, I graduated in May, so now I have a little bit of vacation time before I start my job um, doing some mechanical engineering in Massachusetts. I am 23 years old. I know Gary because um, you worked with my dad before you started hiking the AT, and then you worked with my dad again, and then you decided <laughs> that you wanted to keep talking about hiking. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, you're... Um, yeah, I I think I met your dad. I want to say it was almost about ten years ago. It was so, a while. It was early in a primo, right? That's right. Yeah, it was a that was the uh, software consulting firm that uh, really jump started my love for travel and exploring. And I don't mind saying, uh, you know, a big contributor to that was uh, the long walks after work that your dad and I shared. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, we've probably put in quite a few miles together. Um, really? Although 99% of them are urban miles. Yeah. That's yeah. very cool. Yeah. Or suburban. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So when I met you, I think, you know, I'd, we'd been working together for a couple of years and your dad invited me over to dinner uh, at the house one time. And I think you were, I think you were about, you must've been 13 when I met you then, if it was yeah. you know, 10 years ago, 13 or 14. And uh, I'm a tall guy. You know, my trail name was Green Giant because I'm so tall. And when I met you at 13, you were already taller than me, <laughs> I think. I, mean, I know you are now. What's your? How tall are you now? I'm about six six. Six six. Did, now, did that uh, interfere with your with your kayaking at all? Yeah, it's really hard to find boats when you're that tall, and especially when you don't weigh like 250 pounds. So right now, I have a four fun, and it's really really tight. That's a a, so ja actually, a Jackson, right? Yeah, it's a Jackson. Um, and I kind of messed around with the outfitting to make it as big as I could. But it it definitely doesn't feel super comfortable. Like, my legs fall asleep after a couple hours. So I think <laughs> I'm going to try to upgrade to something that fits me a little bit better in the future. Well, I think a lot of our listeners are more geared towards foot-based activities and don't know that much about whitewater kayaks. But a, a Jackson kayak is uh, a, a, a it's a type of kayak that's known as a playboat and they call it a playboat because it's not it's not so much like a a craft that you board 
as it is a piece of gear that you wear. <laughs> right? Like a, a play boat is really small. Like the boat itself is like, for someone my height, I think a Jackson 4 Fun is probably about four feet tip to um they're to stern, about six half, feet but it's small enough that i remember when i saw them on the water before i kayaked i wondered where people put their legs <laughs> yeah, uh, it's like it's that small mm -hmm. and so, my toes go all the way to the bow of the boat of course yeah how's your roll my roll was pretty good last time i kayaked but i haven't been out in a while yeah yeah well i'm not surprised you're one of those guys who just pick things up you know, very quickly, you you know, immediately excel at whatever it is you attempt. Well, the thing about my role was that I worked really, really hard on that because I started kayaking in college, and my goal was to kayak with my friend Tim. And he was boating about class three, class four mm -hmm. um, at the time, and he didn't really want to paddle the class two stuff that I was paddling, which is fair. Um, so I was like, Tim, like, I want to <laughs> go kayaking with you. He's like, well, you're going to have to learn how to roll first. And I was like, oh, man, I don't know how to do that. So then... Every Wednesday, I would go to the, the AMC pond sessions um, with a few of my friends, and I would put my boat in the water, and they would give me some tips on how to roll. And after like three weeks of doing that, I finally got it to consistent enough that I could start pushing my boating a little further. Um, but I, I made a very concerted effort to make that happen. It's like riding a bike. If you, you, know, if you, if you think about it too much, it really doesn't make sense. You know, being yeah. on two wheels or, you know, flipping a boat using just your, your hips and a paddle. Um, but once yeah. you get it, it's like there's a, – once it clicks, you know, oh, okay, and then it becomes muscle memory. And years later, without even trying, you can just you can just do it. It's a lot like – that's what I mean when I say it's like riding a bike. It's a little more challenging, I think, though. <laughs> there's no training wheels. Uh, they do a pretty good job of, like, easing you into it, um, a lot of the people that I've seen. Like – uh, the way that you roll is you put your paddle on the surface of the water and then you pull down on it so you can flip your boat from upside down to right side up and then they can hold the blade of your paddle um, oh, that's a good such idea. that you have like a lot more to push on um, and then you can do that less and less and less and then you can also have someone there so they can flip you back up if you don't make it which takes some of the pressure off because if you don't flip back up then you have to wet exit out of your boat mm -hmm. Um which just takes a lot of work because then you have to go back to shore, empty your boat out, get back into your boat, and paddle back out to the middle of the pond. That, that's usually how I wind up doing it. <laughs> it is a tried and true technique. <laughs> yeah, I said it's like riding a bike. I didn't say I could do it. I just said it's like <laughs> riding a bike. Um, and you said that you trained with the AMC to get ready for that? Yeah. Is that the uh, Appalachian Mountain Club? Uh-huh. They yeah. have a few different chapters that do paddling um, things. Yeah, you're you're up in Boston, right? Yes. Okay. And the AMC uh, also manages the hut system in the world famous uh, the the White's Mountain Range in New Hampshire, right? Yeah. Yeah, which uh which is actually relevant to what you're about <laughs> to get ready to do, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, your your dad just sent me this picture of you sitting surrounded by piles <laughs> of of uh calories, right? Yeah. I've never had to plan food to this extent before, um, well, so it's been challenging and exciting. Well, tell me, tell us a little bit about what it is you're getting ready to embark on here. Yeah, so um, a few years ago, I kind of heard about this idea called the White Mountain Diretissima, um, and a Diretissima is a something that they came up with in Europe, which is the idea of getting from one place to the next place in the most direct route. Um, so that idea was kind of... Uh, taken to the White Mountains and that someone wanted to go from like the shortest route between all the 4,000 footers, um, which are kind of the, they're the crowning peaks in the White Mountains, the 4,000 foot peaks. And there are so, 48 of these. There are 48. And the goal is to do all 48 of them in one single push unsupported. So carrying all of my food from the beginning, but picking up water, um, as I go. Good Lord, man. Yeah. So it's, um, my route's looking like about 230 miles. Um, and I want to do it in 10 days. Okay. That's a, that's a, then, a fairly aggressive timeline. I, I think even, I think, even for flat terrain and you're going to be in some of the most, 
uh, you know, challenging terrain that the East Coast has to offer. Yeah. Um, not trying to I talk you out of it of... or anything. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely ambitious. Um, getting into this, like once I started the planning process, I kind of figured this would be one of the hardest things I've ever done. Just doing 20 mile days over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, so I've been trying my best to get ready for that. So last weekend we did the PEMI loop um, kind of fast. And we did say again, uh, the what loop, the, the PEMI loop is, is a classic backpacking loop. You do, I don't know, 10, 12, um, 4,000 footers all in a row. And a lot of people do it between four and two days. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's about 30 miles, depending on what side hikes you do. Um, and that's like a new England classic. So we went up and tried that and we did, the first day was a little over 20 miles and I felt pretty good about it. Um, and it was a lot of the same stuff that I'd be doing on this bigger project. Mm, okay. um, so I'm, I'm feeling pretty good that my goals are reasonable. Um, but then additionally to prepare for it, um, I finally kind of stepped into ultralight backpacking. Oh, of course. Um, or I guess lightweight backpacking is probably more accurate. Um, but I know that getting however much weight out of my backpack that I can will make this whole thing much more pleasant. Now, I think there's actually a, a cutoff for what's considered lightweight versus ultralight, isn't there? Yeah, lightweight is a base weight under uh, 20 pounds. Okay. And a base weight is everything that goes into your backpack that is not consumable. So you don't count water, fuel, or food. Okay. Um, and then ultralight is 15 pounds or below and then super ultralight i think is 10 pounds or below oh no kidding super ultralight and i see i knew that there was a, a distinction between lightweight and ultralight i did not know that there was super i think katie is super ultralight really yeah her base pay her base weight uh not only being sub 10 pounds i think it also has a decimal point in it really yeah um so what's your what's your base weight um, I'm going to weigh everything out today, but it's just under 20 pounds, just under 20. Okay. So you're in the, you're in the light, lightweight category. Is that, yeah. So, yeah. That's where I, that's what I prefer to. It, yeah. Uh, I would really like to get a lot lighter. There are a few things that I have that are just massively heavy. So I have a big Osprey backpack, which I love, but it weighs like 78 ounces and you can get one of those hyper light backpacks that weigh like 30 ounces yeah. so that would be huge sure. um and then also i'd love to upgrade to a quilt at some point but a lot of these things just take a lot of time to get because you can't you can't buy them at rei right yeah you, you either have to order them online or you know go somewhere yeah so for my next project um maybe i'll plan a little bit further in advance and try to get some lighter things uh so you've got the osprey pack uh, what's your sleep system um, so I went for a controversial sleep system. I have a 30 degree sleeping bag. It's a mountain hardware lamina Z, which is really heavy. Um, but it's what I have. And then I have, um, is that synthetic, or synthetic or down? It's synthetic. Okay. I have a self inflating. It's like 40 ounces. It's really heavy, mm. um, compared to a quilt. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a self inflating pad. It's like half an inch. It's pretty Spartan. Mm -hmm. And then I have a bivy, a mountain hardware or a outdoor research molecule. So a lot of people this time of year would use a tarp. Um, but my molecule is about 22 ounces. That's not bad. No, it's pretty good. A tarp wouldn't weigh that much less considering you need to carry guy lines and stakes and stuff. Um, and then you also have to deal with the bugs and you have to pitch it every night. Right. Yeah. That was my next question. Uh, is it freestanding? Uh, so the bivy is just, it's essentially like a sleeping bag shaped rain jacket with no poles or anything. Okay. So it's got like a, like an arch, uh, like a little arched pole that goes over your top no. half and no, this is a that? very basic bivy. Yeah. Just sits on your face but it does okay. have a little loop on the top so you can tie a string to a tree oh, if okay. you're so inclined yeah. so you can hold it off your face but the poles like another five or six ounces uh, i think more than that okay. so um i figured i didn't need it 
All right. Yeah, that, that's a that's a pretty Spartan system. That's a, a good way to describe that. <laughs> yeah, I wanted something because I'm going to be hiking, I think, most of the day, every day for this whole trip. I want something that would just be really quick to set up. Um, and that's kind of like a no-nonsense sleep system. Like you put it down and you put your sleeping bag inside of it and then mm-hmm. it's done. You don't have to worry about poles or finding trees or anything. Okay. So 10 days, no resupply. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, are you bringing a stove? Or are yeah. You no. Okay. Yeah, I thought about going stoveless, and I decided that was um, something I didn't want to try for my first time on this trip. I think maybe I'd want to try that on a few weekends first. Okay. Because I'm very accustomed to having a stove. So I have a pocket rocket, and then I have one of those um, Snow Peak mugs that fit a, a fuel canister inside of them really, really well. Oh, yeah. I know exactly the one you mean. Yep. Yeah. So that's pretty light. I think the whole thing's like twenty ounces. Yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, I've got uh, I've got that same. Uh, Katie and I have a, between us probably four or five different cooking systems uh, down in our gear closet. Yeah. I have a pocket rocket, one of the old ones, and um, it's probably not ideal for this trip, but I really like it because it simmers a lot better. Uh, it's so, like a jet boil. Yeah, you get more control with the jet boil. It's either on or off. With, yeah. with this thing, you get varying degrees of heat, and they just they last forever. I think we've had ours for about ten or twelve years now, and it still yeah. goes out with us on every trip. And it was really, really cheap. I got it on sale for like twenty dollars a while ago. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. So, what are you eating? Oh, that's a great question. So, um, I'm trying some new things on this trip. For breakfast, I have some oatmeal and like some freeze dried fruit, and then I also have pop tarts for days where i don't want to do anything oh yeah I and um, Pop-Tarts. yeah and then i'm doing granola with dehydrated milk which i tried out last night and it was really good so i'm kind of excited about that okay yeah that's a good that, one um I, mountain house makes a good one of those with blueberries in it too it's like 550 calories a pop that's cool yeah yeah i realized but, um but the packaging is so bulky yeah so i realized that I'm going to be walking a lot up a lot of hills. Mm-hmm. So I did some of the math out and I'm going to be burning somewhere around five or 6,000 calories a day. So I figured I could deal with a little bit of a uh, deficit, but I definitely needed more food than I'm used to. So um, I'm shooting for about 5,000 calories a day and I'm trying to get <laughs> 150 calories per ounce oh, that's um, amazing. out of most of the food, which is turns out really hard to do. Mm-hmm. So I think, more realistically, I'll probably get about 120 calories per ounce, which will put me at about three pounds of food, maybe a little bit less per day. Any luxury items? I have a bug head net. Um, I went on a trip to Florida last Christmas, um, and we we went kayak, backcountry kayak camping or canoe camping in the Everglades. Um, and the bugs were the most heinous bugs I'd ever <laughs> witnessed in my life. Um and having this head net between that and having like long sleeves and tucking my pants into my socks, it made everything much more pleasant. So I figured if anything was going to get really nasty with the bugs and I didn't have a tent to retreat into, I want my bug net. See, I don't know if that counts as a luxury item though. To me, that sounds like essential survival gear. That's, you know, that that's like, uh, you know, I've got a luxury car. It has seat belts. Uh... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I yeah, you're bringing a ki- like a Kindle or a, you know a, nope. pil- a pillow or any. Do you okay. count a pillow? I don't count a pillow as a luxury item. Oh, see, but, well, uh, see, I don't carry one though, so I I always you know roll up uh, you know my jacket or laundry or you know okay stuff some sack some socks in an old food bag or. <laughs> I've never liked doing that, so because um, I've I've done the sleeping on my puffy thing and I've tried like a towel and I've. I did a wetsuit once, and all of them were just terrible oh, because yeah. they're, like, so hard. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided that I'm always going to bring a camping pillow. So before I had been using Thermarest makes the stuff sack for their pillows, and then I had been packing it with, like, my rain jacket and stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's about two ounces. Okay. And then I found on the internet this other pillow. It's a lot like the Sea to Summit ones that are just air and they're really, really light, and oh, those, those are, are about three ounces. So I'm bringing one of those. Okay, so you know that's a luxury item. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Is. 
Cool. So um, a, a few minutes ago, I want to go back to something you said. Uh, you you said my route is about 230 miles. So are, are there various routes to do the, is it Diratissima? Am I saying that right? Yeah. The Diratissima. Um, so, and can you pick your own route? Yes. So one of the interesting things about this project is a lot of people put their own kind of twist on it. Um, so the first guy who did it decided that he was going to do um, 10 push-ups on the top of every peak. <laughs> okay. And and then there's someone else who decided that they were going to um, try to do everything without repeating any sections of trails, which made them do a bunch of interesting mm. bushwhacks, um, which I wasn't that interested in. And then um, recently, Andrew Drummond, um, he's a an athlete who does ultra marathons and other endurance sports out of New Hampshire. He did it really, really fast. Did it in just under six days. Six days. Six days, yeah. 200 and some odd miles, 48 peaks. Yeah. Um, okay. But he didn't sleep very much. I guess he brought a relatively cold sleep system um, that makes my sleep system look incredibly luxurious. So he would try to sleep, or I guess he did the first couple nights, and he was like, this is way too cold. So then he got up and started hiking, and then he would only take naps. <laughs> it's insane. Um, yeah, I've got a, a friend who is getting ready to attempt a fastest known time of the Colorado Trail, which oh, cool. is, I think, 485 miles, just shy of 500 miles, and he's looking to do it in nine days. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. And... Is he doing it? Uh, unsupported. Uh, yeah, he, it's an unsupported FKT. Uh, in fact, this uh, this guy was on our last episode. Uh, his name is the Hiking Viking. His trail name's Jabba. But uh, yeah, we talked to him at Trail Days. Uh, you ever have any interest in in trying anything like that? Going for a speed a speed record? Maybe I'm not that good at running yet, to be honest. Um, but I'd like to be. I, I, I like how you put like yet to... in there. Like it's you know, but I will be. <laughs> I haven't put that much time into training. So all through college, I'd be like on these hikes with my friends, whether it was a backpacking trip or a day hike. And there would be some section where I would just be getting worked and then I'd look at them and they'd be fine. And I was like, what are you doing differently? And they're like, oh, I ran cross country in high school. Oh, that's all. So, well, I think a lot of people, when they do that, build an incredible base, um, which just takes like a lot of time to mm. keep running and keep building that base. So I, I've been working on it, Okay, but it's a long-term goal. Okay. And and maybe you said, but, and I didn't hear, or maybe you didn't, but uh, is anyone going with you? Nope. I'm doing it alone. Um, I really, since this project was going to be kind of hard for me, I didn't want to be on anyone else's schedule. I wanted to be able to start whenever I wanted to um, and kind of plan Mm -hmm. to do it the way that I wanted to do it. Um, which has been really nice so far. Cause it's like, I got kind of sick earlier this week and it was like, not a big deal. I could just push it back. Um, and I've been keeping the project relatively quiet. Wait, wait, when you say, uh, relatively quiet in terms of, uh, uh I probably told like 10 people so far. Oh, okay. Um, cause I just didn't want to build up a huge expectation in case, like the planning didn't work out or I discovered something that meant that I really wasn't going to be able to do it. But yeah, sure. once I started buying all my food, I was like, this is going to happen for sure. <laughs> I'm going to eat this <laughs> stuff one way or another, and it's not going to be as much fun sitting in the garage. Yeah. I felt pretty committed at that point. <laughs> yeah. It, it's usually that, or, you know, once, once your pack is finally loaded up and on your back and, uh, you know, have have you done that yet? Have you, you know, oh, you said you haven't even weighed your pack yet, so you probably haven't assembled no, all the gear. No, that's a project for today. Um, I just got the last of my gear in um, off the internet. Um, so I got it yesterday, so I'm going to weigh everything and then um, pack everything up and see how it goes. Okay. Now, I, I, I notice, I can't help but noticing that you uh, have multiple times referred to this as a project. Um, you know, how, how aggressive is your timeline? How, uh, have you blocked out time for fun? I guess is what I'm asking. Uh, <laughs> nope. Didn't leave much time for fun. I think that <laughs> of course, <not. laughs> I, uh, I kind of thought that the planning of this whole hike has been really, really fun. Just like working through all the logistics, learning about the history of the hike, 
learning about other people's attempts and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've, I guess I've taken it pretty seriously because I, I figured it was going to be really hard. And then the other thing is that with this self-supported stuff, like if I wanted to do it in 15 days, then I'd have to carry another, I don't know, 10 Mm -hmm. pounds of food, 15 pounds of food. Um, which I think just trying to keep it as light as possible will make the whole project a lot more enjoyable. Yeah, so it's, that's... It, it's a, a an intricate uh, dance. It's a, a, a tricky balance to nail that, um, you know, if I if I take too long, I carry too much food, which slows me down, which makes it take longer, which, you know, there's, there's an inflection point and you have to find that sweet spot. And I think, uh, you know, it sounds like you're sounds like you're right, right on it or pretty close. Yeah, I've also been really excited about this idea of like covering as much ground as possible in a day. Yeah. Um, okay. So I think that this is going to give me a chance to try a lot of that. And what's your timeline? When are you thinking about starting? Um, I might be starting tomorrow or I oh, might start geez. on Sunday. Okay. Yeah. All right. So it's really coming up. I have <clears throat> kind of the rest of the month to try it mm-hmm. um so i need to start in the next few days if i want to finish before i start work okay all right well um don't let me keep you from it <laughs> oh no um, no this is great yeah I, I had one more question you okay so you mentioned that you're going by yourself and you know i know i know you're an eagle scout and an accomplished whitewater paddler and you know you you do this sort of thing you're gonna be fine but what's your safety protocol for this yeah. So one thing that was kind of important to me was that my cell phone was going to work in case I really needed it. And I also got rid of my camera and left my book at home so that I, and then I'm going to try to use my phone for both of those things. So I brought up mm-hmm. or I bought a big battery so that I would have enough juice to make it through the whole trip. Okay. Um, and then I also got a spot yesterday so that Everyone will know where I am, and then if I'm really in trouble, I can do something about it. There you go. But the thing about the whites is on this whole trip, I haven't really counted, but I'm not more than like 10 miles away from the road ever, and a lot of the trails are pretty busy. Um, so I'm not – a lot of it's on the AT, so those trails should be at least a little bit more busy. I know we're kind of out of season. Right. Um, yeah, but between just all those things – yeah. So between all those things, I'm feeling – uh, pretty safe. Okay. All right. Well, good. I, I, I knew that too, but I just wanted to hear you say it. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Cool. No, it's right. important. It, it It is. And especially in the whites, um, you know, that mountain range in particular is no joke. You know, we always say, be careful in the mountains, be careful at high altitude, but you know, the whites is where, uh, Mount Washington is located, which is you know, some of the most extreme weather ever recorded on earth. Uh, that's not hyperbole. That's scientific fact. The instrument that records the wind speed was ripped off. Uh, <laughs> you know, we we know that a world record was broken, but we have no idea what it was because the anemometer was destroyed. Yeah, and it's amazing that it's three hours outside of Boston. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, last uh, oh, last thing. So. Uh, you know, we were talking about your route. Uh, where are you starting? Where are you finishing? What uh, you know? What highlights are you looking forward to along the way? And then I'll let you go. So the traditional route that a lot of people have done starts at Moose Lock and then ends at Cabot, and those are kind of the two outlying four thousand footers in the range. Um, so I'm going to do that. And looking back on it, I kind of wish that I tried to do it backwards because I think that would have been kind of fun. Um, because I don't know if anyone's actually ever finished it backwards. This project, albeit a little bit obscure, has only been completed by about eight people. Eight um, people? Yeah. Okay. Not very many. At least that I've found on the internet. Um, I know So, like, there were a few articles that came up in 2016, and they were saying that it was about six people around then, and then I've found a few more people that have finished. Hmm, okay. Right. Um, yeah, so it's likely that I'm going to be somewhere around the 10th or the 12th person to ever do it if I make it to the end. Um, so yeah, I guess it's kind of interesting that it is kind of well-defined, but it leaves a lot of room for interpretation. Well, I'm sure we can, uh, if, the, if that few 
people have done this, I'm sure that we can find some way to make yours be, you know, the first or the, well, well some superlative. You're the youngest one to have done this, or maybe, yeah. you know, you're the tallest person who has done a deer tisma. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. Um, to be honest, I, one of the big things was that I've spent a lot of time in the whites through college. Um, but I've never really been that big of a hiker. And I really wanted the chance to become super familiar with these mountains. And I I was like, yeah, like, I don't know if I'm ever going to really make time to do my 48, which is, <clears throat> um, it's like a big thing in the, n- like, New Hampshire hiking community to mm-hmm. do all 48 of the 4,000 footers. Then you have a party on the last one. Right. Um, and I have a few friends who have done that. Um, but it, it involves a pretty serious commitment. And I was like, oh, like, this would kind of be a cool way to really become extra familiar with the white mountains, get a chance to like really experience them and to learn about all 48 of the 4,000 footers kind of all in one big, um, project. It sounds amazing. Um, so I think that's like the driving fun thing. Um, I don't think I really did a good job of planning a bunch of like mini fun things into the trip, but there are a few really cool waterfalls um, and like ledges and swimming holes and stuff that I'm going to try to check out. Cool. Well, I'm really looking forward to, uh, you know, I hope we get a chance to talk after. I want to see some pictures and hear some stories. Uh, yeah, sure. That sounds great. Yeah. I enjoy talking to you. This is fun. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty excited to let you know how everything goes. Um, I guess the other luxury item that I forgot to tell you about is I'm bringing a notebook, which oh, okay. you can argue isn't a luxury okay. item, but I really like being able to record everything um that's going on because i think capturing that stuff while you're doing it is a very different perspective than trying to remember it right after you finished it's true yeah um a year from now you're gonna look at that and see you know one sentence and it's gonna just you'll you'll relive hours based on that one one note yeah so So, great idea yeah should be good Cool, man. Well, right, well, I'll let you get back to it and, um, you know, tell your mom and dad I said hi and uh, be, yeah. care- be careful out there. <laughs> Will do. Thanks oh. again for your call. <laughs> Thank you, man. Bye. Bye. Hey, Megan. <laughs> Gary? <laughs> hey, you know um, how we always tell people a great way to support the show is by joining our Facebook group? Yeah. Well, we still want them to do that, but we also have that. Of course. And we still want them to do that, but we also have something even cooler now. What's even cooler than our Facebook page? Our Patreon page. Ooh, tell me more. Patreon is not just a way to support the show. It's also a community. It's got its own built-in community, but it also gives our patrons access to a special chat room that we're going to set up, which lets people listen to us record the show live and in real time while it's happening. Or wait, wait, there's more. You ready for this, Megan? They also will have the ability to ask questions to not only us, but our guests while we're recording. While we are recording, they get to be a part of the show. How awesome is that? So cool. I just, it just like, see, that's how it works, mate. Like, I'll do 47 shitty takes, and then in the middle of thinking about something else, it'll just, and it comes out. Okay, that should be good enough. And, I, and I'm not going to do like a formal, hey, welcome to blah, blah, blah. I do all that later. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, Griffin and I had a phone call. It was the day before you left, right? Yeah. Or maybe two days, something very close. Yeah, it was either like the day or the day before or, or pretty close. It was two days before because you left on a Sunday and Gary, you called me when I was at work. Ah. And I remember being really obnoxious in my office, being really excited, taking a personal <laughs> phone call. I never take personal <laughs> phone calls when I'm at work or like around my coworkers. Yeah. And I was just like cracking up and so excited about this. Um, I was just kind of blown away that you know that this is even a thing. Why don't you why don't you tell us again, Griffin? Even though we already have it on tape, other you know somewhere else. But uh, give us a quick rundown what what this thing is. 
So the Duratissimo is a project that someone came up with a few years ago, um, adapted from this concept in Europe of getting from one point to the next point in the most direct way possible. Um, so the White Mountain Duratissima is you're supposed to hike from um, each between each of the 4,000 footers, all 48 of them, in one continuous push unsupported, which means you carry everything except for your water, which you're allowed to refill, and you're not allowed to take gifts yes, or food or anything from anyone. It's about 250 miles. People do it between the record is just under six days, um, and then people do it typically 10, 11, 12 days. Even on flat ground, that's a lot of weight to carry in terms of food, I think. Ten days yeah. is... Um, yeah, Megan, what's the most you ever carried for a single resupply stretch? How many days? I'm trying to think of that as you guys are talking about that, but I honestly have no idea. Five? Maybe? Yeah, I, that sounds about that? right for the AT. Um, cause you did yeah. the hundred mile wilderness in what, like three and a half days, something like that. Yeah. I was planning on five days. Um, and then we, d- we found out about you being ahead of us and I was like, <laughs> not, not going to do this in five days. Just going to run right through. But I did have help. My dad did, um, stop in the middle there and feed me. So I, I it wasn't really a full stretch of five days of carrying all of my food. It was so most my, of it, but not all of it. My longest carry was just this past November when I did the Foothills Trail. I took seven days to do it, and seven days of food is the most I've ever carried under any any circumstances. And I didn't really realize it until I did it. How much that weigh for you? You know, I'm not one of those guys who likes to hang his pack on a scale, so I don't really know. Um, I just know that it was it was too much. That first day, I was you know, <laughs> really bent over under that stuff. But uh, Griffin, you were packing ten days worth of stuff, and I know you. Yeah, yeah I think what was that like? Before that, the most I had ever carried was five days of food. Um, so this is definitely a lot, and I I packed a lot more food than I think I typically would because I think on a ten day trip like this, I didn't want to run a huge calorie deficit because I think I'd get pretty beat up. Um, right. so five thousand calories a day which worked out to about three pounds of food per day. So 30 pounds food total. Yeah, just about. Gosh, that's so much food. That's Yeah, that's a lot. Um, that's a give lot us a, of weight. Like a I mean, quick... with my high base weight, oh, that would break me. <laughs> Same here. Um, so what, what did that 30 pounds consist of? So I had a lot of bars. I did – I so I haven't really done that much of my own backpacking food because – a lot of the time when I do weekend trips, I'll pack like fresh food um, and stuff like that. So this is the first time when I've really had to pack my own like large stretch of non-perishable foods. So I did like some ramen, some like lentils, some couscous, some quinoa. Uh, I tried peanut butter and jelly tortillas um, out of those like squeeze tubes. I like mixed peanut butter and jelly together before so it'd be easy to assemble. I did oatmeal. Um, granola, pop tarts, a bunch of chocolate. I packed a lot of trail mix every day, mm-hmm. and then, then I did freeze dried meals for about half my dinners. And you were pretty ultra light on everything else too, right? Uh, I mean, I I did my best with what I could. I've learned a lot over the process. I know that I have a lot of progress that I can make. Um. But my base weight was just under 20 pounds, and I think with a little bit of work and some money, it could I could get it down to like 15 pretty quickly, which would make a pretty significant difference. Oh, I bet, yeah. It's amazing how, how big of a difference just five pounds can make. Yeah, definitely. Although, five pounds is like uh, some luxury like food so even. I mean, I'm just thinking yeah. of my own, my own taste. I do like carrying candy. Um, And there's not a whole lot of nutritional value in that. Sounds like everything that you had for the most part had packed a punch as far as nutrition goes, because you had to go with nutrition dense stuff for such a long haul. Uh, I brought a bunch of of chocolate. That's nutritional. I mean, (laughs) I think that serves the dual purpose pretty well. Um, I did like a bunch of Snickers bars and stuff like that. I guess I brought some, like, 
energy gummies, which I consider to splurge because they're pretty heavy with so much water in them. I don't really think about that. Yeah, that's those like the ones that have caffeine in them. I tried one of those. I bought uh like a pack of shot blocks. Um which were fine. But I think that I really like trail mix the best and like bars. I I learned about these bars. They were like a company out of Taos or something and they were delicious. It was like the best bar I ever had in my life. Do you remember what they're called? Nope, I totally should have saved the wrapper. <laughs> okay. I think yes, because I've never heard like of a, like any type of bar that actually tastes good. Really? I actually really like it. Which is fortunate because I ate a lot of them. I mean, I guess I really stuck with Cliff Bars only, and there's only one flavor of Cliff Bar that I like anymore. But I haven't really found many energy bars that don't give me a longing for something tastier when I'm done eating them. Even if they're filling, I still want to eat something that tastes better. <laughs> kind bars are essentially candy. It's like a lot of them are oh, like almonds true. with like cherries and I don't consider kind them. bars to be um I consider those like a snack and not like a like a energy bar though. That's... I consider like a Luna bar or a Cliff bar to be an energy bar and then a kind bar to be like a a tasty snack. I so actually... I cuz I do like kind bars. It's I... just the the dense energy ones that are kind of I had a kind bar right before we started recording to give me energy for the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, I thought those were really good. I also, I did. You can really eat did. like in your normal life. You, you wouldn't really take like a Cliff Bar and at your office job and be like, "Oh, this is gonna be my snack." But a <laughs> kind bar could that. totally really. I can't yeah. do it. I just can't. I can't do it. To me, those are just there's just so much density in them for me to eat them when I'm just like sitting at my desk I'm like I, I look at the the calories on it and I'm like I have not earned this at all now if I've worked out in the morning that might be another story but I feel like it's just too much for my body they're also not the most well, I'm hungry all the time thing in the world either so I'm like the calories that I can get yeah, well, I'm. I don't need as many calories as I can get. I don't really have that fast of a metabolism yeah, anymore. <laughs> so, Griffin, you're six. What, six five, six four. I'm six six, and I'm twenty three. Oh, geez. Okay, so you're six six. What do you weigh? Six six. Crap. I weigh about one eighty five. Yeah, so you can eat some Cliff Bars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You probably should. Probably some fried chicken too. <laughs> it doesn't pack very well. <laughs> Unless... No, but it's Only so good when you go into towns. <laughs> you could uh, bring some chickens with you, and I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where we're going with this. Well, if they walk themselves, it doesn't contribute to your base weight. <laughs> That's true. Put a leash on them. Leash your chicken. <laughs> Take your chicken with you on the trail. No chicken. And then, <laughs> bang. What's the regulation in the whites regarding bringing a chicken on your hike? I think we'll have to ask. Therapy. That vest on it. You'll be good. A lot of people <laughs> brought dogs, so I would imagine the chickens would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just imagining hiking in the whites and coming up upon someone who's just walking a chicken. Like, how ridiculous. <laughs> With a leash. <laughs> With, a, With leash. a leash. Like, oh my god, that's so ridiculous. Can someone do that, please? Anybody? I don't care who it is. <laughs> Anybody, please. If someone you will. walk a chicken in the White Mountains and take a picture of it and send it to us, I will, I don't know, give you money? No, don't do uh, that. What, what can we do? We can give them something. Um, we'll, if somebody walks a chicken in the Whites on leash, we'll have them on as a guest. That's a great idea. <laughs> That's a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of people uh, who have watched chickens on a leash before, but not hiking. Did you just Google this? Of course I did. <laughs> Chicken a little sweater, and then they put uh, an attachment point for the leash on the back of the sweater. This is amazing. <laughs> um, let's. So let's Gary, we definitely need an Instagram page so we can start posting pictures like this on our Instagram page. Hey, this you're right. Perfect. You do. And I think you're going to start that, aren't you? Oh yeah, that's right. That's my homework. Okay, I'll work yep. on it. <laughs> okay. Someone right. wrote a whole website on how to train your chicken to walk on a leash. Oh my god. 
Oh my God, they have harnesses. All right. I'm going to make an Instagram page this week and I don't know how I'm going to make a splash. And the, I guess the first thing is going to be a, a chicken <laughs> on a leash. Well, get, uh, let's do this first, get the page created, then tell me what it's called. And I'll mention it on, in the, uh, in the intro or outro of this oh, that's episode. A, that's a good idea. So we can get that on the air. We'll also talk about our, okay. pa- our Patreon stuff too, but we'll, we'll, cover that later um let's let's talk about the whites for a second because i know a lot of our listeners are familiar with the whites because many of the people who listen are either at hikers aspiring or you know have some familiarity with the trails but we've got we've got listeners worldwide now did you know that we are we are on the air (gasps) on the air i'm making quotes like we're a radio show or something our little, our little fake yeah. radio show is on the fake air in finland and australia <laughs> we've got listeners in new zealand and a whole bunch of other places That's where they so might not cool. know they might not know what the whites are um you guys want to tell us a little bit about the whites the white mountain national forest it's in new hampshire yeah. it's in new yeah it's in new hampshire and it's uh generally considered some of the most difficult hiking on the east coast is that safe to say yes definitely okay definitely. yeah having they hiked... apparently go ahead i guess this is unconfirmed they're allegedly really big mountains that are super old and they've eroded down they used to be bigger than the himalayas and they've eroded down to what they are today oh i didn't know that piece of information that's cool i hope it's true yeah so it's it's pretty crazy terrain it's you know they don't do a lot of switchbacks there's a lot of hand over hand work Uh, Sometimes the local trail clubs will just bring in like a 14 foot aluminum ladder and lean it up against a wall and leave it there. Um, I say wall, I mean like a sheer rock wall Mm. and cliffs. So it's, you know, it's pretty challenging hiking. So to try to attempt, you know, roughly 250 miles of this in 10 days while also trying to hit all 48 of the 4,000 foot peaks up there is just mind boggling. Yeah. That's a, that is a big project to tackle. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Especially because that amounts to 20 plus miles per day. Mm -hmm. And it's important to note too, that for the through hikers who started down at spring round in the South and worked their way North, they've gone at that point, maybe almost 2000 miles, right, Gary? Like 1700, 18, 1700. So even after having all of those miles under their belt, most through hikers are you know, they're doing 20 mile days at that point and are told by other hikers, and this is true, that your mileage is going to drop in half or something. And it's going to go well below 20 miles a day. Way and down. for most people, that is absolutely true. The mileage that you maintain daily is not 20 plus miles. So doing this and, and through hikers, by the way, once they get there, they've got 1700 miles on their belt. They're in really great shape. And then it drops their mileage down that much. So attempting to do 20 plus miles a day through the whites is just mind boggling to me. It's kind of crazy, but that's, what, that's, crazy. What, that's what Griffin does. He does crazy things. That's cool. We like crazy, cool people. Like cool, crazy things. Yeah. Like Griffin cool, doesn't, crazy. doesn't run through the post office with a chainsaw crazy. He, you know, right. <laughs> he, he does fun, <laughs> fun, fun, crazy. The so, fun, crazy, the, the relatively safe, fun, crazy. I say relatively safe because hiking can be considered dangerous at times, but it can. it's not holding a chainsaw while running through a post office. Dangerous. I'm getting message messages here. Oh, and by the way, I did, oh. um, I consulted the Google engine. We, just, we lost, and we lost Griffin. Mount Washington. Oh, we did. Yeah. That's what that message yeah. was. Wi Fi. There we go. Oh, I'm still hungry. I didn't even notice he was gone. I had a. Are we back? There you go. Oh, you're back. Yeah, I had a, I had a different window open. I didn't see your face drop off the thing there. What, what was the last thing you heard? Uh. I think I was saying that I thought that the White Mountains were taller than the Himalayas and then eroded down, but that's unconfirmed. Have we been talking for that long without him? <laughs> I, we, yeah. I think oh we God. just... So I went <laughs> off, I talked for like at least three minutes and I was like, guys? Oh, that's funny. And then, oh, God. 
on. That's... And then we just started blabbing. Blah, blah, blah. Where's Griffin down here? Blah, 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 blah. Wow. <laughs> but what I was saying was that um, the whites are really close to like the or the metro areas in Boston, Maine, and then they have an awesome trail network that's uh, maintained by the AMC. And the AMC has done a killer job clearing out all the blowdowns already this year, which is incredible because uh, there were a lot of blowdowns on the trails. Um, and a lot of it's wilderness areas, so they can't use chainsaws, so they go through with axes and they cut it all by hand. So intense. And then um, they also have a really awesome system of like huts and campsites that are like managed by caretakers that are friendly and they have outhouses with composting toilets and stuff and it's super rad. And they make food. They have real food. But that was the worst part because I couldn't eat it. Oh, that's right, because oh. you're walking right, right so, through these huts, and you're probably going in there and stopping, getting yeah, water, but you can't, you can't have the food. Oh, and they have soup and, like, hot cocoa and brownies. So hang yeah, on a second. So uh, I'm going to back up and, and talk about that for a second. So the, the Daratissima doesn't count if you, like, have some hot cocoa or a chocolate chip brownie or whatever at one of the huts in the Whites. Is that right? So... I guess who this decides this? Is really not for a list necessarily. Like everyone kind of does it their own way. So I think if that counts for you, then that's fine. If you want to like eat some food that someone gave you as a gift, but in like the truest spirit of the project, you're supposed to carry literally everything that you bring except for water or everything you use. So you're basically pretending that it's like your last man on earth kind of situation, and you're just trying to get from point A to point B. Yeah, kind of. So I learned that that's actually not very fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, don't be mad. But the way you say it. No, I think it's super fair. The first night I was out, um, I got into camp really late because I didn't realize how heavy my backpack was. So I went over, I started at Moose Lock. I went up and down Moose Lock. It was like seven miles, and I knocked it out in like two hours. And I was like, wow, I feel really great. Um, so then I like, was like, okay, like I only have 10 more miles today. Like I pretty much just did that. I just need to hop over the Kinsman's and get to the shelter and make dinner. Like, this will be great. <laughs> just um, hop and on, just hop on over one of my friends who came yeah. up to hike with me, my friend mm-hmm. Alec. Um, and we started up the first hill and I was like, Ooh, this is going to take a while. Um, so then do you mind if I ask one, which, uh, which wild. side of Musalak did you go up the North or the South face? Um, I went up from Beaver Brook, which I think that's the north. Okay, so that's uh, that would be traveling south on the AT, then, right? North of the summit. I'm just I'm I'm asking because they're they're, they're very different it, approaches. I think it's traveling north on the AT. Yeah, if you come up from the south to Musalak, it's a little more uh, graded Ooh, and switchbacky. That's a good, but, good question. Yeah, that north was there side... an area, a stretch in the beginning where there was a bunch of waterfalls and there was a shelter halfway up, and there were. Yes. Um, okay, so that so then he came from the from the north side up over and then down the south side. Wow. Um, no, I actually went out and back on that. Oh, you went out and back. So you went up and down the same trail. Yes. Yeah. That's. Oh, geez. You went up and down the hard trail. I was just. Gonna, that's what. Yeah. That's why. <laughs> but I asked that's because... advantageous because I didn't have to carry my backpack over the mountain. That. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Oh. And so... then that also put my car on the Kangamangus, um, which is the highway that kind of runs east to west through that section. It's of the way white. more convenient to access that trailhead, definitely. Yeah. So if I ever wanted to bail, it was going to be easiest to get back to my car that way. Gotcha. Gotcha. So those are the a few reasons why I did it like that. Okay, so you, a, did you say you trail. slack packed? You left your pack at the bottom and just you hiked up and down? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I hiked up and down. I bought this day pack. It's called the Ultra Sill, and it weighs two ounces. And it turns out it was my favorite thing that I brought. Wow. Oh. Was it comfortable even at just two ounces? Yeah, the straps are really wide, even though they don't have any padding. And I never really put that much in it. It was mostly just like a water bottle, some snacks, and a rain jacket. No. Um, so it was great. I loved it. So I'm sorry, I cut you off. Um, you said you, okay, so you did Musalak, and then you hopped over to Kinsman for your first night at camp. You got in late. Yeah, so that's actually a long AT the whole way. So I'm sure a lot of people are pretty familiar with that section. Um, 
Yeah, so I got up to First Kinsman around sunset, and then I got into camp. And then there were these two kids from Tufts who had just graduated, and they were doing, like, a two-week trip through the Whites um, with a bunch of resupplies. Um, but they had made, like, this delicious lentil quinoa, like, turkey thing on their, like, they had a super luxurious stove that used a giant canister of propane, but, like, it was, I was really jealous. Um, and then they, like, offered me some of that, and they offered me taffy, and I was like, guys, like, I can't eat any of this. Oh, God, that's painful. want to. Because it's, like, so much nicer to, like, share things with people, and then you, like, feel like everyone's working together. I'm like, no, like, I'm doing this on my own. Like, super (laughs) sorry. Uh, so, do you think that affected the morale at all? A little bit. Yeah. It's, like, to a certain extent, kind of fun, because you're, like, I'm working on this, like, big thing that has rules and stuff, but at the same time, you're, like, I would really like to, like, share my food with these people and be friendly. You know? It is a little bit isolating to be doing, even if you're around people, it's kind of isolating to be doing your own thing and your own challenge. Um, and I... I mean, if I were doing that, I, I would fail the first day because <laughs> no one offers me food. I am eating it. <laughs> it's your yeah, I think that's pretty fair. So how was the weather um, that first day? The next day, I went over to the hut that's not too far away from the Kinsman shelter. And um, I guess they had made way too much cornbread, and it looked incredible. And they were like, oh, like, do you want some of this extra cornbread? And I was like, I would want nothing more in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Oh, it's so painful. So is that a a fairly common rule for people attempting this, or is this your rule, or what's what's generally the split? That is, is like, a big part of the project is that you're supposed to do it unsupported and not accept gifts. So there is one person whose name is Mats who did it, and um, he talks about how he stayed at this bed and breakfast, and the guy offered him coffee, and then he was like, no, like, I can't drink your coffee, but I'll drink coffee with you. And he, like, made his own coffee with his jet oil. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, oh. I would be terrible at this. It's hard. So I, I think if I were to do it again, I'd probably relax a little bit. Okay. And, like, take the food gifts. It could be more Take fun. the free cornbread. So that's actually why I made cornbread yesterday, is because... <laughs> by not getting that cornbread. <laughs> oh, it's making up for it. Oh. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, now I'm hungry. <laughs> so day 1, uh how many how many of the 4000 footers did you get? Was it just Musalak or three. Either... 3? Okay. Yeah. So day one was supposed to be easy because I kind of wanted to settle into the challenge. But the issue is that I started on a Sunday and then the next day it was supposed to rain. Um, and I was supposed to do 27 miles that day. And I was like, well, that's just so maybe I could do cannon on if everything goes well. But then I ended up getting into camp at like nine and then like ate dinner and passed out. So then that put me in a really bad place for day two. Okay. Mm. So, day two, um, motivation was low. I tried. I had never tried waking up to my alarm on my watch before, but I was trying to save my cell phone battery. Mm -hmm. And then it turns out when my watch started beeping, I was, like, delusional because it was really early in the morning. And I was (laughs) like, oh, I would really like that noise to stop. So I turned it off, and I went straight back to sleep. So I, like, already was on kind of a bad foot when I, like, slept in by accident. Um, and then rain was supposed to come in in the afternoon and it was supposed to be epic thunderstorms with massive wind. And I was planning on doing Franconia Ridge, which is also on the, um, which is like super beautiful hiking, um, much more fun on a clear day when you can see all the views. Super exposed. Yeah. There are no trees for about four miles and not very good options to bail. So on a windy day, you can get into a, or on a stormy day, you can end up in a dangerous situation. How about yeah, maybe not the best place on a thundery um, day that might have some lightning happening. Yeah. So um, first part of the day was to climb Cannon really quick. So I wanted to do that before the thunderstorm started, and that was no problem. 
Um, and that was super interesting because I hadn't even been out that long, but it's like you get to the top of the mountain and I saw the, this old woman who was having kind of a tough time with the trail and someone who appeared to be her daughter. She was probably like 70 and then the other one was like 50 and I was like, wow, your clothes are really nice. How'd you end up here? And then I was like, oh yeah, you can ride the tram up. <laughs> and there were like all these people on top of this mountain. So that was kind of fascinating. Anyway, um, yeah. so I went up and down Cannon, and then I got to the bottom, and I was like, okay, like, I need to figure out a plan for where I want to sleep tonight, because it was supposed to start raining in, like, the next two or three hours, and I was planning on hiking a really long way to get to the base of Owl's Head, so anyway, totally changed the plan, decided not to do the ridge, and I was going to hike up to the, the um, oh, I forget the name, it's something Spring, Liberty Springs Campground, which is right below the edge of the ridge. Um, close to Mount Liberty, um, but below tree line. And I thought that would put me in a good position to do Franconia Ridge early the next morning and get back on track. And then on my way over there, right when I was about to go underneath the highway, it was like the skies opened up. The trail flooded with like four inches of water. Like before I could put on my rain jacket, I was already soaked. And then there were just like sheets of water coming down. And then, because I was going underneath the highway, I, like, just sat under the bridge, and I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and then, <laughs> I was like, well, I guess if I needed to quit, like, this is a good time, because I could take the road back to my car. And then, the rain kind of lightened up, and I was like, okay, like, this is fine. I can go walk up that hill. I only had to walk, like, three more miles to the campsite. But the Liberty Springs campsite doesn't have a shelter. And I just had my bivy. And sleeping in the bivy in the rain isn't very fun. Um, so Does when it I got any type of rain co- cover on it? I don't know. I, I've never slept in a bivy before. So the bivy sits straight on your face. And if it's really raining and you have to zip it all the way, then you just have really bad condensation. Ooh. Yeah. So Ooh. turns out, though, there's one tent site that has a tarp hung up overneath. So they have tent platforms here and they had a tarp um, set up over one of them. And I got the other people that were on there to share it with me. So then I could keep um, the bivy off my face. So I didn't have the nasty condensation, but like literally everything that I owned was wet because I was already soaked to the bone before I made it up there. So that uh, definitely gave me a hit to morale. Yeah. Yeah. Just back to back, just getting getting punched in the face with rain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like to think that you haven't. You're not really struggling in a challenge until you've you're absolutely soaking wet and going to be for the next twenty four to forty eight hours. Or if you're sitting underneath a bridge by yourself in the rain, oh. it's also <laughs> another way to know that you're going through some some type of challenge. Well, the other tough thing was that I knew that my stuff was going to stay wet for a really long time, long time because I was moving so much that I couldn't hang things up to dry. Yeah, and if it's going to keep raining, there's no way it'll dry on you. Mm-mm. So, yeah, and so at that point, like all of my like primary set of clothes were wet, and then I got to camp and I swapped my clothes, but then it was still really wet the next morning. So then all of my other clothes were wet. So like literally everything in my whole backpack was wet. so fast forward to the next morning i actually woke up on time because i started using my phone for my alarm again this day three Um, now day three this is day three okay um already behind by like uh 15 miles not bad um kind of bad considering (laughs) i at this point i was supposed to have hiked 35 miles and i was already behind by like 40 percent oh well when you put it that way yeah yeah Yeah. i would say it's not bad but very difficult to make up that's how i was thinking about it and i guess that's one of the hard things about being alone is that there wasn't anyone to be like no like it's gonna be fine i was like wow this is terrible and i have no (laughs) idea how to deal with it so man so i was kind of trying to work through that um but i was like okay like Gonna have to fire this up and see if I can try to make some progress. So, um, oh, one thing that was super helpful is I, I've hiked a few of these mountains, but not all of them. And I was talking to the caretakers at every campsite that I went to, mm-hmm. and they would 
give me some sort of beta on like good ideas on how to do the next step. So for instance, on Canon, you can do the Lonesome Lake Trail or you can do the High Cannonball Trail. The Lonesome Lake Trail is shorter, but apparently it's like super steep and there are a lot of boulders to climb over. So Mm -hmm. almost everyone who like works at the hut or at the shelter, they all take the High Cannonball Trail and they said it's way quicker. So that was super helpful. Um, and then for the next day, I was planning on doing Owl's Head or camping at Owl's Head so that I could do that the following day. And I wanted to run around the south side of Frank Honey Ridge to get there through Lincoln Woods. But then I talked to the caretaker and he convinced me to go up past Garfield, uh, oh, Garfield. which I am still not sure if that was the best way to do it, but it was a way. Yeah, Garf- Garfield um, is... Um... That's what? that's the one where uh, Tupac and Breakfast Club and I got pinned down for two days in a. It wasn't a snowstorm, but it was sleeting. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, the Garfield shelter. That's uh, there. You... There's that a hut there. Yeah. Or it's, it's not a, a hut. It's an actual. It's a shelter, just a shelter. with a caretaker. Oh, I'm trying to remember that one. I don't know. I kind of. I think I flew by it. You may have. Yeah, that's the one. I may have. Uh, Griffin, did you stay at the shelter on Garfield? Did no, I didn't. Okay. Um, I continued past it. They have apparently some of the best water in the White Mountains there, though. There's a a sweet spring. I remember that. That shelter. Mm-hmm. Are you saying that a lot um, of people don't filter it? And it's it's really good in that way? or just People said that they don't filter it, but I filtered all the water that I drink. Good. It's a good idea. Just in case, you know. I, yeah. I had gone on some backpacking trips when I was younger, and they got me really afraid of Giardia. So ever <laughs> since then, yeah. I filtered everything always. Yeah, I, but, uh, I'm i the same way now. I I mean, I always was before, but now I'm extra, extra careful about having not just a filter, but a backup, too. Now that I've... Ooh. Yeah. I keep, yeah. like, two or three tablets... In my, like, when shit hits the bag, shit hits the fan bag. <laughs> um, so that if, like, I lost my filter or something bad happened to it, then I could, like, have enough water to get out. Do you have, like, the iodine tablets or the other chlorine stuff? I have some other brands that I've used before, and they actually don't taste very bad. They taste pretty fine. Hmm. Um, but I heard iodine tastes really bad. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't think I've ever had it, but um, I carried a few tablets myself just in case. But then they got wet, and then I threw them out and said, "Nah, the heck with it. If it gets so bad, whatever. My my filter will work. I'll figure something out." So I like to live on the edge, you know. <laughs> I had done. That's living on the edge for me. Iodine Fair tastes enough. the way a hospital smells. I love the smell of hospitals, so maybe I should have some iodine tablets. Well, but you're in the I medical just, profession, so the smell of a hospital equals money to you. <laughs> it's just soothing to me. <laughs> <laughs> it always has been. Honestly, before I even wanted to go into what I do now, um, like way before I was even in university, it's always been like a comforting smell. I don't know why. I think it's because my mom worked in a hospital when I was younger and in a lab. So she'd come home smelling like those like disinfecting chemicals and all of that crap. So how do you feel about the probably. smell of band-aids? Do band-aids have a particular smell? Totally. Like the yeah. rubbery smell? Yeah. Oh. I mean, I'm sure yeah, the, I mean... the used ones are worse, but... Um... <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't need the smell of decaying no. flesh. Thank you. Oh, hey, so um... Jen, Katie and I uh, did, a couple years ago, we did this uh, like gourmet coffee subscription thing. Where... Yes, you were supposed to tell me the name of that, and I keep forgetting to ask uh, you. What Angel's is it Cup. Again? Angel's Cup. Angel's Cup. Okay, yep. thank you. And they would send us, uh, you know, a couple of samples every month. And there was an app that came along with it. On the app, it gave you uh, different ways to, to like, rate and uh, describe the flavor profile. Essentially, the goal was, you know, if you do enough of these, you learn how to be a proper coffee connoisseur and detect notes and things like that. But on the smell chart and the taste chart, one of the 
one of the flavor profiles was actually called Band Aid. No. Yeah. There, there, like, you <laughs> what? Could, yeah, yeah, you could tick a little thing and said, oh, I detect notes of watermelon or, oh, this one's a bit chocolatey. Uh, one of the choices was Band-Aid. And we could... <laughs> oh, my God. I might have out. to subscribe to this thing just for that now. <laughs> well, we never could never figure out why that was even there. Like, why the fuck would you want your coffee to taste like Band-Aids? And we were at some, uh, you know, some espresso place with a proper barista, and he was you know, telling us about, you know, coffee and, oh, wait, this guy knows what he's talking about. Let's ask him. And we asked him about the Band-Aid thing. And apparently that means that something went wrong during the roast. So it's not something you want, oh. but they included it on the fl flavor profile. But it was, like, of course, it's a negative. You don't want your coffee to smell like Band-Aids. Right. But can they come up with a more, like a different term, like rubbery? I, see, I don't know. I think it's a, a very distinct... Like, nothing smells like crayons, nothing smells like Play-Doh, nothing smells like Band-Aids. BRB, gotta grab a Band-Aid. She's gonna do this. She's gonna smell a Band-Aid, and we're gonna, we're gonna find... How the hell did... Why are we talking about how Band-Aids smell? I just, I really want to know what it... I seriously don't know how we got on this tangent. Hold on. Yeah, it's kind of... Yeah, it's a plasticky kind of rubbery. <laughs> this is award-winning okay. broadcast right here. <laughs> All right, I'm going to put the band-aids back now. We can return to the normal conversation, but I don't think I'd want my coffee to smell like that. So anyway. Uh, yes. I, so anyway. <laughs> I ended up doing Franconia Ridge the next day, which was be clear and nice but it turns out that the whole ridge was sitting in a cloud essentially oh. so it was like super windy the kind that kind of knocks you over every once in a while mm -hmm. um like mm -hmm. miss so i was the kind where you can't see the I'm... blazes or the karens that are ahead of you you could see pretty well but i just was like kind of unhappy because i was so wet um so anyway, I like made it over Franconia Ridge, and then from there, there's a notoriously bad spot where there are just lots of PUDs, um, pointless up and downs. Mm -hmm. And I was like I love working. That. <laughs> I've was... never heard that abbreviation before. I like that pointless up and downs. Can I've you... actually like learned that when I was learning about this project. Um, <laughs> the whole thing is pointless so... ups and downs, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it kind of is. Well, there's a point, but well, yeah. so I guess pointless up and downs are when they don't contribute to like a mountain. It's just like you're kind of doing it because it happens to be intermediately there, but you're not going up to a mountain and you're not really going down into a valley. Like it doesn't really contribute to much. It's just you're going up and then you're going down. There's it's no like reward, just hiking no along reward. a ridge line between two points that just goes up and down. Um, it's more like tiny sub mountains. On the that are like added into the ridge line. Oh, pathetic little mountains. <laughs> yeah, but they're just enough to really grind you down. Just you annoy know? you. Yeah. So I actually had planned out my whole route to avoid this section, so I was kind of dreading that I ended up changing course to decide to do it. Um, and then I was sitting on this ridge, and I was like kind of gassed, and then I just like sat behind a rock and like sat there for like twenty minutes, and I was like, why did I decide that this would be a fun idea? And I, like, contemplated the whole project, and then the cloud kind of just passed, and then it got sunny, and I saw the views, and I was like, oh, this is kind of nice. <laughs> and I was like, I guess I can keep walking. So then I, like, already made it through my my mid-trip uh, crisis. And, uh, kind of I, existential there. You know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I ended up in it earlier than I would have liked. Um, but anyway, so I was like, okay, like I have enough time that I can make up Owl's head and then I can be like pretty back on schedule, um, if everything goes well. So I got pretty excited. I ended up meeting this really cool guy who was on the AT and he had like done the first 400 miles with his son and then he just retired and then he was going to finish it. 
And I was talking to him and he was like, yeah, like I recently had a brain tumor and they cut out this chunk out of my head. So now I have wicked bad balance. And he was saying that it was like wicked hard walking along the ridge, but it's super cool to hear his whole story and everything. Anyway, so we were like chatting and then I get um, down to that point where you're supposed to go to the Garfield shelter. Mm -hmm. And I'm not paying attention. I'm like, oh, well, I don't want to go there. I want to keep going down to the valley. I should go this way. So then I found this like beautiful trail and I'm like cruising along because the grade's really nice and it was downhill. And I was like, this doesn't feel right. So then I like figured it out that I was going the wrong way for like half an hour. <sighs> and that was going to totally jeopardize getting up Al's head that day. Um, it was a huge bummer. So then I like turned around, made it into camp kind of early, but the round trip to Al's head was nine miles. Um, and I didn't think I'd be able to finish before it got super dark. And it's, notoriously kind of bushwhacky and i didn't want to do it in the dark um and the trail at is really well maintained since so many people are on it but these trails down in the middle of the pemi loop um are a little bit less improved and there are a lot more blowdowns on this because people just don't hike it very frequently um and like lots of spider webs lots of mud mm. a, a number of the sections you're just like walking through a creek um Ooh. so i didn't really want to do that at night no. so I, um it's kind of a recipe for getting lost yeah a poorly worn trail I, um by headlamp yeah i i think alone by headlamp would have been kind of rough so then i opted not to do that um so i like went to bed early and then decided to do owl's head the next day and Spirits were kind of low at this point, so I was like, I'm just going to do Owl's Head today. And, the, like, my body was kind of beat up. Um, even though I hadn't done that many miles, the backpack was kind of taking a toll on my knees and ankles. So, and then, so I decided to do this all in trail runners, and it turns out that was a bad idea. But I figured that I was only going to have a really heavy backpack for a few days, and then it was going to be light enough that I'd get by. Um but I think if I were to do this again, I would bring really heavy boots. I know other people have brought heavy boots and carried trail runners, but I wasn't super interested in doing that. Do you use trekking poles? Uh, I wasn't planning on it. And I talked to Andrew Drummond, who had done it recently, and he was like, yeah, trekking poles are a wicked good idea. And I was really grateful that I brought them. Oh, good. Yeah. Trekking poles are the only way I still have knees. Yeah, I have notoriously flimsy ankles. <laughs> so. Yeah, you're talking to the queen of rolling her ankle. <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, there's been plenty of times when I've been hiking up or down something and Gary's been behind me and my ankle's fully rolled. Gary, remember these times? Oh, yeah. It's yeah. fully rolled and I've kind of stumbled on my trekking poles have caught me and he was like, oh my God, are you okay? Thinking I've just broken my ankle or sprained it so badly that I'm out. But it's just what my ankle does, which is why I wear trail runners so that my ankle can do that. What? Because if it... If it didn't do the rolly thing, then I would be down on the ground. I swear, oh, really? Your foot touch yeah, your it's a, it's a weird point. twisted logic, and but it's just it's the way it works for me. Oh, yeah, it's probably not healthy. I kind of figured. <laughs> so I rolled my ankle, like I don't know, like moderately badly two or three times, and like half the time it wasn't even on anything that gnarly. It would just be like flat. And I'd be looking around and I'd step on something bad, and mm. I'd be tired. Um, and it was always like a bummer, but my ankles did a pretty good job keeping up with that. But I think that it fatigued other parts of my legs when my ankles were like kind of sprained. I've definitely tweaked my knee from an ankle roll. That's, that's a oh, real, really? but again, trekking poles are what has, they have saved me on numerous falls. I always notice I, when I I've originally got a... started without trekking poles on, on the AT hike and that was a bad idea. I've always noticed when I have a really heavy pack and I'm super top heavy, it, it tends to stress my core a lot, like my my lower abs and my obliques from just trying to really? stay upright and balance. It's almost like getting a you know like get, like doing crunches the whole time. Really? Yeah. Ah, oh, I never get that, but I also have lazy abs that are very difficult to engage. I wish that happened. I didn't have any problems with that, but. I did try to pretty carefully balance my pack every day, which I think might have helped a little bit. 
Yeah, that's that true. goes a long way. Mm. So uh, at this point, how you said your your body was starting to, you know, you're feeling the the wear a little bit. Um, can you tell us more about that? Because I'm really curious about how your body was able to sustain doing this for as long as you did. Okay, so um, my ankles were kind of sprained, so that was difficult. Um, and then my knees kind of hurt a little bit on and off, but that would typically go away. My feet felt kind of bad because they were constantly wet after the thunderstorm. Mm-hmm. I had brought three pairs of socks, but I had gotten all three of them wet. And I think if I were to do it again, I would have managed my three pairs of socks better um, to have a dry one once everything dried out. But mm-hmm. uh, I didn't do the best job this time. Okay. So my, I tried to like dry out my feet whenever I would stop for more than like five minutes, so that like the socks would dry out and my feet would be like less. Rooney, because I think yeah, that that's right. where I really started. And I brought, um, it's called like Lifto tape. Are you guys familiar? Lifto, L I L U K. Oh, Luco tape. Yeah, it's Luco tape, and it has a really strong adhesive. Um, and it comes in a big roll, and I guess that's what a lot of people use rather than moleskin. Now. And uh, I was really happy about that. Oh, so it's like a, it's similar but, to moleskin in that it's like cushiony. Okay. So this was mostly just, it stuck really well. So it would stop the rubbing. Ah, gotcha. Moleskin, which I believe the idea is to like lift the, like the rubbing area away from your skin. But this was mostly just to like protect the area. Hmm. Um, But it worked well on my soggy feet, but I think at some point my feet were so saturated with water that there wasn't a whole lot that I was going to be able to do. Um, So that was kind of a bummer. I found it. And then... Leuco tape. L-E-U-K-O. And it's all one word. Leuco tape. Sorry. Yeah, it's great stuff. Um, So anyway, so I used that to try to keep the blisters away. But that was kind of a losing battle. And then, like, my Achilles tendons would kind of feel bad at some point. Um, And that got worse later. But I think that was just because my backpack was so heavy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Um, most likely. My ankles were just not used to it. Um, That night, I got into camp, and I was like, well, I'm already way behind schedule, and I, like, don't feel that great. I was like, maybe tomorrow I'll just do Owl's Head, which was nine miles. And then I'll like, I can leave up my clothesline and just dry everything out. And then the next day I can hit it hard and and try to do all the miles that I was planning on doing in the future. Um, So I actually did exactly that. I managed to dry out my socks overnight. So the next day I got to start with dry socks. Um... It was a sunny day, and I left everything on my clothesline. So by the end of the day, my whole backpack was dry, and I filtered a bunch of water. Um, and I made it up Owl's Head, no problem. And I found the secret bushwhack, which turns out I actually found it by accident because I was, like, walking down the trail, and I was just paying attention to, like, staying on the trail because it's, like, a little bit faint. Um, and then all of a sudden, I was like, this doesn't look very familiar. It's a, an out and back up the mountain. Um, and then I ended up in this river and I was like, oh, like (laughs) this isn't what I was supposed to be. Um, I actually used my phone a lot. I downloaded the whole map for the area and I kept my phone on airplane mode, but it can put your little GPS tag on the map. Um, so on a place like Owl's Head where I wasn't on the trail, it was really convenient because I could see that I was in the wrong spot on the topo and I could compare that to my like paper map and figure out what was going on. And so this I figured is a secret out that I, bushwhacking trail? Yeah, so it runs um, like just south of the traditional slide trail up. And I guess I thought it was going to be an actual bushwhack, but it turns out it's just a trail that people made rather than like an organization. Um, but it's like really well defined. And unlike the slide trail, um, you're not like climbing over a bunch of talus. It's 
really just a trail. So I had like passed people on their way down when I was on my way up and I must've been 20 minutes behind them. And then by the time I came down, because I accidentally took the bushwhack trail, I like beat them to the bottom. Oh, wow. So that was awesome. Oh, wow. So you got dry and socks, the sun is I, out, you're passing people, things are improving, right? You're feeling better. You're feeling better. Yeah. I felt great. I ran out of water. But it turns out it wasn't a big deal because the trail was so good on the way back and I like knew where everything was that I just like zipped right back to camp and I like felt really good. Um, So I had a bunch of time because I decided that I was going to try to rest so I could be in tip top shape for the next day. So I like went swimming in the river, which was super cold. Nice. Um, And I I got this. um, It was backcountry pantry. Pad Thai, and it was unreal. It was so good. <laughs> yeah. That um, good. So I had that, and I like talked to some people and like went to bed early, and that all felt really good. And I woke up the next morning um, pretty early, and I felt great. And then I like started up on my way to the hut. So this is day four, um, and there is like going to be a big climb on my way to the hut. And I was like, okay, I'm probably going to end up going really slow. So I figured it would be about one mile per hour. And then I ended up like zipping up to the hut probably twice as fast as I expected. And I was like, wow, I feel so good. And then they had like a bathroom with running water and soap and everything. <laughs> so I was kind of excited about that. Oh, you know, we love bathrooms on this show. Um, we're, a, yeah. we're a big so anyway, fan. And then I, yeah, so that's the, um, oh, I forget the name of the hut. It's the Galehead hut. And they have like beautiful composting toilets. Um, and you can pee in them, which I thought was luxurious because you're not <laughs> right. You're you're not yeah. uh, like backcountry outhouses. It's funny; it didn't even really take very long for you to realize that uh, composting toilets that you can pee in are luxurious. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely a weird. Um, I like thought about welcome that. to the club. <laughs> and then they had running water and a mirror, and I was like, wow. Um, <laughs> So that I, was super, I love hearing, so I was feeling great. I love hearing like you know hikers get to the point where running water and a mirror is the high point of your day. Yeah. <laughs> like you completely... running water, peeing in a toilet and a mirror that is the tops. An experience that redefines your definition of luxury is either Yeah. You know, like a five star And it's amazing cruise. how something as simple as that can lift your spirits too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, at that point, like, morale was super high. Um, And I was like, I think I can finish this project on time. Like, I can start making it miles and everything. Like, I felt so good. So um, a couple weeks before, we did the Pemi Loop, where you, I actually did this whole section of trail before. Um, So I was supposed to go up South Twin, which is a pretty steep hike for a little less than a mile. Um, And I know the last time we did it, we had hiked a lot that day, but I got super worked. I was just so tired on the way up. And then this time, I just like zipped right up and I felt great and I did it super fast. And I was like, wow, like today is going so well. Um, so then I love that feeling when you've done a trail before and it's kicked your ass and then you go around a second time and you kick its ass. Yeah. And the other thing was that my backpack was probably 30 pounds heavier than it was the last time. Yeah, see, that's even better. Yeah, so I, a great I was feeling. really good. And then I went over to North Twin, um, and that trail is, like, really beautiful and really good views. And then I got back to South Twin, and then, like, my Achilles tendon started to feel kind of bad. I was like, huh, this is weird. So then I took it kind of slow. The next step was to keep going around the loop um, over to Mount Goyer. Um and then my like Achilles tendons and my ankles started feeling kind of bad. So I went really slow over to Zealand, um, which is medium flat with like a couple ups and downs. And then at that point, like my ankles were not feeling great. And it was too bad because I was making awesome time through the whole day. And I was like, I could go really far today. Um, but I decided... Like, every time I stopped, I felt pretty good for a few minutes. And then if I kept walking, it would start to feel bad again. So I think that my body is just really tired. So I uh, camped that night at the Goyer shelter, um, which 
was great, except for I got there really early. So I had nothing to do for a long time. What's so early? I finally went and I saw the West Bond sunset, which is like a big thing for people doing the Pemu loop. And then that was super beautiful. Um, and I like hung out with a few people over there and went to bed early. And then I woke up the next day and I think I just decided that I hadn't like worked my body up to being able to do the miles with the weight required to keep doing this for another week. So then I decided that I was going to see how it feels, but I was in a really good position to bail because I had mentioned that I intentionally put my car on the Kangamangus so that it'd be easy to get back to it. And I was going to be hiking to the Kangamangus that day, one way or another. Um, So I worked my way down the trail and I was like, okay, like I'm going to get to the, the big river that runs through here, the East branch of the Pemi or the Penobscot. Um, and then I was going to see if I like was up for fording the river. Cause I had heard from some people that it was kind of difficult. Um, but I got there and I had no problems at all. Um, I probably only got up to like three inches above my shoes I found a pretty wide spot and I just hopped across a bunch of rocks and I was like on the other side and then I made it through the bushwhack and I was feeling really good. And then my plan was to do another, I don't know, 12 miles that day. It was around lunchtime um, and do the Hancocks and then camp on the other side of the road. And then I was like flying across the trail. It was super, super flat. Um, and I felt pretty good, but then my ankles started feeling really bad. And I was like, I don't know if I can make it up the Hancocks today and like still like safely and make it down before dark. Um, so eventually, are you guys still there? Yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're still listening. Here. Okay, cool. So, uh, um, I want to know if you took anything for your, for your ankle pain. Like, were you, were you doing anything to try to treat the ankle pain? as it slowly progressed more and more? No, I didn't bring any painkillers, which, because I I probably haven't taken painkillers in the last 18 months. It's just not something that I really do. And I was like, mm-hmm. maybe I did something. And I was like, I don't know. Like, I don't know when I would ever use them. So I didn't. But I think that that might help with the swelling just from, like, the thumping constantly. Yeah. Um. But no, I... I kind of felt like rest was going to be the best thing for my body rather than trying to throw chemicals at it. You have a point there. Both is always nice. Excuse me? I said both is always nice. Rest and chemicals. (laughs) That's fair. (laughs) So um, anyway, I got to the base of the Hancocks and I was like, I could probably make it up this mountain, but I'm going to be like limping up the mountain and that's going to be really terrible. So I decided not to do it um and there's supposed to be weather coming in over the next few days and having already suffered through that last bit of wet weather i wasn't that excited about it so i ended up marching over the kangamangus and hitchhiking back to my car to try to get some rest um, get some real was, food yeah as soon as i like got in someone else's car that was the end of the project though because then i would like you're very clearly supported as soon as you're yeah. riding in a car. Yeah. Sure. But I, you um, know. So that was like disappointing, but it felt like a good move since I was alone um, and there was more weather coming in to kind of call well, it off for now. Rain is really demoralizing, or it can be at least very demoralizing. And even just knowing that it's on its way is not. You have to, you, you make a decision. You get, do you keep going into what's going to, what you know is going to be miserable or do you go get some pizza and beer or whatever your, <laughs> whatever your, your thing is. Well, Griffin, yeah. I think you did the right thing. I think you did the smart thing. Um, shit. Sometimes, I mean, getting off trail is the hard, that's the hard thing sometimes. I, uh, you know, I yeah, think a, 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 hard a lot of people get sucked into that mentality of, you know, finish line fever and they ignore the signals that their body is sending them. And you clearly did not do that. And I think, you know, you um, you did the right thing, man. Yeah, I, I definitely learned a lot um, through, like, the process of hiking that section. Um, kind of about, like, 
what I would need to do in the future to get my body ready to carry loads that heavy. And also about setting more realistic expectations early on the hike. Because I think that I could do longer days closer to the end of the hike than what I was doing there. Um, But in the beginning, I think I would have stuck to like a couple really low mileage days, like 12 to 15 mile days for the first three days. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I would have brought a little bit more food and space staff. I think that would have kept me healthier and just generally a little bit happier. So to the that section. point, the the route that you take is pretty much up to you. Like anyone attempting the Daratissima, you know, there's not a defined start and finish point. You just have to hit all 48. So, yes. you know, yeah, so you could conceivably attempt this again and, you know, like you said, start with shorter days where you eat more of your pack weight down at the beginning, kind of develop your trail legs as you go, and then by like day or six or seven through ten, you know, that's when you're hitting your stride instead of doing the big miles first. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah, I think that that would definitely have worked better for me. Do you think it's something you're going to try in the future? Um, I really want to finish it. But I guess the tough thing is like making the time because you really don't want to do it during a bad weather window because you can't do any of the peaks and it's kind of hard to make progress when you can't climb the peaks mm. since so much is above tree line. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I guess I'm going to have to feel this one out to see if I'll ever try it again. And this is the kind of the ideal time of year to do it too, right? That's, you know, warm, but not yeah, hot. That was one of the big things that led me to doing it right now is that you want to do it in June when the days aren't super hot. Um, but it's still summer. So you don't need to carry a lot of heavy things and the days are really long so that you have as much light as possible. What kind of temperatures were you getting up there? Um, during the day it was somewhere around 60 degrees. A lot of the time, um, obviously fluctuated a little bit in the valleys, Mm -hmm. uh, compared to the summits. And then at night it was usually around 50, but higher up, it got really cold one night down to like 30. Oh my goodness! Well, wow. but um, yeah, it's been it's been kind of a mild start to the summer. Nice temperatures. Well, I think we're getting close to ninety down yeah. here tomorrow. Come on down! Ooh. Oh, really? Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. I think our overnight lows tomorrow's are, high is fifty three degrees where I am. That's that's the high. That is lower the than low our overnight overnight low tonight is in the sixties here. Yeah. We're getting close to freezing tonight. Wow. Yeah. So, but that has an impact. No, tomorrow. But that has an impact on, you know, on a project like this is that, you know, where you guys are located, your temperatures, your whole weather patterns are completely different. So when you say, you know, here it is, it's June, you're talking about hiking in a rainstorm from where I'm sitting. I'm thinking, oh, that sounds great. No, when you're at 4,000 feet and it's 50 degrees and raining sideways, that's a completely yeah, you don't different... want a rainstorm. Yeah, so, yeah, Griffin saying, like, oh, I'm wet and miserable means something a lot different in June than someone saying that down here. Yeah, yeah. It's not just a storm that comes through and, and breaks the 80-degree-plus weather. Mm-hmm. It's it's quite bone-chilling being in that type of weather, and and bone chilling cold is quite demoralizing. I I have <laughs> I have a difficult time hiking when I'm when my feet are soggy and my entire body's wet. Mm-hmm. It's not fun. Dude, one of the other thing, one of the other things that I noticed was that I feel a lot better with rain when I have a tent because I have a lot more space to stretch out, and um, it's easier to keep things dry and to dry things out. Mm-hmm. And you have a place to go away from all the rain, but in the bivy there's really no escaping the rain. Like you're- it's all around you. Yeah. Yeah. You just, you just lie there and think about it. <laughs> yeah. About what you've done. <laughs> you can feel every wet part in your body just that much more because you can hear the rain. Yeah. <sighs> so I think it would be really fun if I did it again to do it with someone else. And then I could mm. bring a tent. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. It's but I, some of the weight. Other people in the whites do tarp too can you can you bring a dog can you borrow someone's dog just have have it carry some of your gear for you 
Oh, that's a great idea. How about a llama? What about a mule? Just get a mule. Or a goat, actually, in the mountains. Goats. Your emotional support goat. <laughs> that's what I want. I missed all of that except for emotional support goat. You came back you know, at the perfect time. That's the only part you really needed to hear. That's fair. Yeah. I think I could have used that. The emotional support goat. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, the goat can climb the rocky faces and can carry stuff for you. So <laughs> so if anybody I I... out there wants to carry their, bring their chicken or their emotional support goat into the White Mountains, please do take a picture of it. And send it I to think us. I could have used a cat that would just sit in my lap at the end of the day and just. Oh, work. a warm cat. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. I want, to, I want to know: Can you, if you have an emotional support goat, can you teach it to hold the leash that the chicken is on? <gasps> That's a great <laughs> idea. Ooh. I wonder if anybody's done this. So what? So what day did you get back to the car? Was it day five? Day six? Uh, day six. Day six. Okay, so six days in the whites. What was your favorite part? My favorite part yeah. might have been Moose Lock because I still felt really, really good, and the views were absolutely incredible. It's one of those – it was a perfect New England day where it must have been, like, 65 or 70 degrees, like, not a cloud in the sky, and just, like, super still. The air was super clear, and you could see everything. It was just beautiful nice. out. Um. So I started out on a pretty high note, but then I also found incredibly deep satisfaction cruising up that climb that I just talked about on South Twin, um, Mm -hmm. because I felt way stronger than I was before. Oh, now I want to go hiking. (laughs) Yeah, me too. With a goat. Yeah, with a goat. I really (laughs) wanted to go to the Whites this weekend, actually, Um, but then obviously there's been like rain and crap. Right. Yeah, yeah it hasn't really been ideal. No, I, but but hearing about really your like, hike just amplifies my my desire to run away into the woods. So I know what I'm doing next weekend. <laughs> in case yeah. anybody happens to be in the White Mountains, I'll be there next weekend. Really nice. So I I, I learned about this thing. I learned about this thing that my friend was trying to do. It's called the Pemi Traverse, and. I don't exactly know what it involves, but it's like you start in Lincoln Woods and you end in Carter Notch. Um, anyway, I found a trip report of these guys on Hike the Whites who did it in like a nasty rainstorm where it was raining sideways, and they did it in a weekend. And I don't know. I feel like I think that I could do more to mentally prepare myself for hiking in nasty conditions and being happy about it, and it would make something like this a lot easier in the future. But I've been typically a pretty fair weather hiker, and I've done a lot more things like rock climbing and backcountry skiing. It's like, if you're rock climbing, you don't go in the rain because all the holds are wet and that's no fun. And and then if you're skiing and it's like nasty snow, then you don't go out because it's either going to be like wet, so the conditions will be really not fun, or it'll be dangerous um, if it's too heavy, or it'll be a great day because it's snowing and it'll be like really excellent skiing. Um, so like hiking, I've always figured like, if it's wet, I'll just stay home. And I think that I would benefit a lot from kind of going out in terrible days and embrace. Yeah. There is something to be said for, um, the mental preparation that you get from hiking in bad weather. Um, like right now I have the luxury of saying, ah, I'm not going to go out when it's not good weather, but when you're doing something longer, um, and you, you absolutely have to go through bad weather. It's, it really does build up your ability to just kind of, kind of say, Oh, well, I'm not going to let it get me down, but it's so, it's really difficult to do. It's really difficult to do. Well, like on this whole thing in general, um, you know, I wanted to ask specifically about, uh, you said you talked to Andrew Drummond. Yeah, briefly. So, uh, so I know he's done it, and I think we figured out that about eight people have done it total. Um, how many of those eight did it on their first try? Ooh, great question. You know, I have no idea. I felt like everyone did it on their first try. Because that's the only but one they ever talk about. I tell you about their failed tries. 
That's I mean, entirely possible. Who knows? I know a lot of them were very experienced hikers. So, like, this woman who goes by Apple Pie did it, and she had hiked the AT, and she makes these sock puppets so that she can work seasonally and then go hiking um, kind of whenever she wants the rest of the year. Okay. And then cool. who did it? Um, but I forget their name, but they have a really detailed blog on it, and they had done, I think, like, the 48 by 12, where you do all 48 4,000 footers every month of the year. Oh my like a bunch of other white mountain giant um like projects. Oh. And I am definitely Andrew Drummond has done all sorts of crazy backcountry skiing all through the whites. He's a ultra marathon runner. Um he's done lots of bushwhacks and stuff. So I think I I'm not as experienced as a lot of these other people, so I think that that certainly helped them a lot. And just really knowing what they're getting into. Okay. Well, you definitely learned a lot on this one. Or so, yeah. And I so think say. one thing that was really important for me is that through the planning process, I felt like I got almost everything that I really wanted to get out of the trip, like already before I even got on the trail. Like I had such a fun time kind of learning about the history of everyone else who had done it and like scouring the internet for all the other trip reports and routes and all the other things that people posted about this trip and like Mm -hmm. articles and stuff. Um, And then I had a lot of fun trying to build up my backpack and get my base weight down. And then I had never really like delved into backcountry food on this level. And I actually loved all the food that I ate except for my tortillas. Cause I made (laughs) them buying organic tortillas that went moldy. And that made me really sad. Oh man! I didn't find a trash can all six days, so I had to carry all my food. Oh God! Your kids. That's the other thing that gets hikers really excited. That it's it's interesting to see. It's not just the bathrooms like we talked about earlier. Seeing a trash can, I remember running towards a trash can. (laughs) So excited! You remember that, Gary? Oh yeah! Oh for sure. Yeah, yeah. I ran across a parking lot in view of other cars, like people in cars and stuff. I'm pretty sure there's like a road there or something. So excited to see a trash can, but it's a real thing. Like carrying all of that garbage is so heavy and it's just such a waste. It's like, why am I carrying this? I could just get rid of it if only there were just a magical trash can because that's what they are when you're doing something like this. Isn't that what the fire rings at the shelters are for? (laughs) <laughs> only some garbage can be burned though no 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 <laughs> like i was pretty careful about paper repackaging all of my food so that it would be like minimally heavy on the end or like after i'd eaten it mm-hmm. uh, but one thing that's interesting is those freeze-dried meals come in really heavy packages compared to everything else that i use oh they do yeah i never thought of those i never i've never really had too many of them but like so the the foil type package yeah like okay backpackers pantry or mountain house um well i guess they're they're made and correct me if i'm wrong cuz i don't eat them very frequently but aren't they made so you can make the food right in the pouch yes. yeah so they, exactly they're, they're durable so they have to be other heavier yeah so all of my other food was either in like super thin wrappers like a cliff bar wrapper or right. it was- I repackaged it into like the shittiest Ziploc baggies that I could find so that they'd be super light. Oh, repackaging Um, food all the way. I mean, isn't it amazing to sit down and take out, take your food out of its original wrapper, repackage it and realize how much extra packaging there is on the stuff we buy. Yeah. It's pretty painted. I remember being really sad about that, sitting outside mm-hmm. a Dollar General on a curb one time. <laughs> I, mean, I, I had like an existential moment where I was like, what are we doing? This is so awful because that's, there's just so much trash there. Oh, just yeah. so much garbage. And again, it's like, not only does it, is it horrible for the earth, but it's also, it's heavy shit that you have to pack out. You can't, it's not like you can just leave it at the shelter or burn it or like, Stick it in your friend's backpack, although that is also a viable option. Um, and even like after you drop off your garbage, you find a trash can and you're, oh, fine, I got rid of it. An hour later, you've eaten something that's produced garbage again. 
You're pretty much twenty four seven just saddled with trash on a through hike. Well, I think the other interesting thing was when I was preparing all my food, I ended up with like a full paper shopping bag filled with like boxes and wrappers and stuff. And then after six days on the trail, I fit all of my trash, including a bunch of tortillas that were moldy, into like a not even full one gallon Ziploc bag. Wow. Which is like way smaller. Wow. Yeah. What a difference. So, yeah. So, like, that's kind of incredible to me. Stupid. Uh, like, there's all this extra all stuff. Cardboard boxes and the flashy, shiny stuff. So you you re- I know you really in- enjoyed the planning process and you know doing the calculations for calories per day and miles per day and all that. Um and I know when we talked before you started one of the things you said you were looking forward to was you know becoming more familiar with the whites and getting to know you know just the whites in general. How do you feel about that now? Yeah, that was really really cool. And I think a big part of it that was cool was like learning more about all the folks that work there and help make everything run and like talking to like the through hikers because mm-hmm. um, there are a bunch of AT folks moving through and then talking to all the caretakers and like learning about how they take care of the outhouses and how they're like fixing up the trails and stuff. Um, and it was also just cool to spend six days of pretty uninterrupted time in the mountains and kind of like adapt to the pace again because i hadn't done that in a while i've done a lot of trips that involve a car um so like i've driven across the country a few times and that's just super different because you're on your own schedule but as soon as a car is involved and like all the electronics association associated with it um it just like keeps you in a very front country headspace but for me it was like i kept the internet off on my phone so i would text people a little bit um, but I could just, I was like very present and I could like feel a lot more about what was going on in the mountains. And it was also really cool to be so connected to the weather. So I, don't, I didn't necessarily do the best job familiarizing myself with the whites, but it was very cool to like kind of be back on the schedule of being hiking for such a long chunk of time. And I know that was only a week and I'm sure it's like way different to do that for months on end but i thought that was really fun but but, a week is all you need to to get a taste of it and now i just want to go backpacking even just hearing about it makes me want to go out and i'm kind of i'm looking right now i'm sitting in my living room i'm looking out my window at the trees outside and i'm thinking when's the next time i'm gonna get to do something like this maybe this weekend I've just planned this weekend. How many? I'm trying to plan like how many nights can I actually spend? How many miles can mm-hmm. I go? Because now I just want to get out there and turn my phone off. Yeah, that so, sounds great. One of the other things that I thought was fascinating is that I started to remember how backpacking when you're because um, Gary, you had mentioned um, in our last phone call mm-hmm. that I didn't leave very much time for things that were fun. And I did um, say that. I had actually been thinking about that. And I think if in the future, I definitely don't think like this is obviously a special case when you're trying to do like a really long unsupported project. But I think it would be much more fun to build in rest days and short days when you can just like enjoy stuff rather than trying to push miles and like push your body every day. Because um, I think I got kind of tired of that. And like the day that I just hiked Al's head. And only did 10 miles without a backpack. I was like, felt very refreshed that I had time to like stop and like see some of the stuff going on. And yeah, I mean, it's cliche more than just crush miles. It's cliche to say it, but it's true that, you know, lessons learned like that apply to things off trail as well. Oh, totally. Like, you know, any, any, project or something that you're endeavoring towards in life you've got to take breaks or you're going to go crazy or hurt yourself physically or mentally uh, a way of building in me time and taking care of yourself i mean don't take a zero in the middle of you know an fkt attempt or anything but uh (laughs) yeah yeah 
I also, I just want to say, I, I, you used a phrase a few minutes ago that's going to stick with me for a while, and it's, you said you were in a very front country headspace, and I, I just, I just like, I like that. I like the way that sounds because it's the opposite. I haven't heard of, that before. Yeah, I've never heard that before either, and it's, it, it, it makes so much sense. You know, I like it. I do too. Yeah, I think. Yeah, did you coin that term, Griffin? I think you just did. We're gonna give it to you. Yeah, I think I might have made that one up. I think I I've like used it. it before. We're giving um, it to you. That's a good one. <laughs> but you heard it here first, folks. Front country. Yeah, headspace. I think it's it's really important because I think in like in my front country headspace, I'm so worried about everything else that's going on, like like in a much larger sense. Whereas in a my back country headspace, it's much more about what's happening today and what's happening tomorrow and what's the weather doing, and like that kind of stuff. Um, which I, I think is like, I don't know, just like a really different way of thinking about stuff. It's kind of neat. It's a kind of I like almost it. hyper focus. You know, there's an urgency to it, but it's also, um, I mean, it's fun in and of itself. Just getting out there and you know, reducing the whole experience to the only things you have to worry about is water, finding a place to sleep, and. It's really breaking it down to its elemental forms, breaking yeah. life down rather to yeah. its elemental forms, what you're doing. I'm waking up. I'm moving here. I need to think about food. I need to think about water. Cool. And what, what's the weather doing? But that's, you know, that's all very basic stuff instead of um, all of the, the big concerns that or what we see as being big concerns in, in the real world. So what's next for you, Griffin? Oh, for me? Yep. So I really wanted to pick up this project again and try to do the back half this week, but the weather's supposed to be bad enough that I don't think that that would be necessarily super fun. Um, but I guess we'll see. Because okay. I still have five days of food left. <laughs> and I was like, I still have like five to six days of hiking left. Yeah. I like the you way you it. think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to do with all of this food and hiking time? Give the days off. Hiking food time. I I have next week off. Um, but it's just like, I don't know if I really want to do it if there are going to be thunderstorms. So I have to think about that some more. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah and then I start up my new job two weeks from tomorrow. And then I'm back into working world pretty soon. And then you'll never get to hike again. <laughs> not not for more than three days. But I've already been like dreaming of the the early morning, um, like camping out on Sunday night, waking up at five o'clock in the morning and driving straight to work. <laughs> yeah, yep, I've done that. I think I. Can I think I could pull some of those off. I, sure I'm a big fan of like the leaving on a Friday afternoon, getting to my destination. And I have like a full weekend of everything. That's my plan for this weekend. I just, it's happened during this call. I've done that yeah. in my head. This, that's the plan for this weekend. I'm leaving Friday afternoon. I'm driving to the whites and then I'll figure it out from there. I think I might have that's to do awesome. something similar too. Look at that. Griffin, you didn't you didn't do the Daratissima, but you have inspired people. So good I job. Was, I think that's wonderful. Um, I was trying to think about like what I was gonna call it, and I was like, maybe you could call it the Dira, and then someone'd be like, oh, what's that? I'd be like, well, I was gonna call it the Daratissima, but I didn't finish. <laughs> <laughs> Just shorten the name a little bit. The deer, uh, the deer, deer in the headlights. I don't know. I got nothing. <laughs> so, I was... so what do you guys, I'm not sure how much like hiking alone you guys have done, but when you're hiking alone, what do you usually like do to pass time? Like, are you just content, like existing or do you like, yeah. do... Oh, this is one of my favorite topics. Go ahead. I love this. Um, cause one of the, one of the biggest takeaways that I took from, from my through hike was how to be alone with myself. And that is something that we, we kind of take that for granted or like, we don't really, we don't know how to do that. I should say we don't take it for granted, but we don't know how to do that in the real world. Be alone. Like even, even just the question, what did you do to pass the time is, um, 
it's indicative of, of our society wherein we have to be doing something all the time. Like how many times a day are we checking our phones or it doesn't have to be technology related, but communicating with other people. One of the hardest things I learned was how to just be alone and do nothing and just be my, by myself and be comfortable with it too and be happy. That's a huge thing. Just, just walking, just walking and hiking and being alone with my own thoughts. That's it. It's great, but it's something that's definitely learned, I think. I'm- and I'm kind of in the same boat too. And we, we talked about this before, like, um, you know, hiking is kind of what finally gave me the ability to achieve stillness and kind of switch my brain off for a while. Cause it's always, you know, racing thoughts and ideas and oh, I got to do this and here's my next thing. And no, you get out in the woods and it's just, you know, my feet moving and the wind and the trees and yeah, I can just be, I can just go out there and exist. But on the it's other hand, thing. I have also I've I've used hiking as a way to, you know, kickstart and fuel ideas. Um, like when I was writing and I would get stuck on some, you know, just any idea, I found that getting out, hitting a trail, you know, get about an hour in, stop thinking about everything and the ideas just start coming out of nowhere. So um, I don't know. I, I, I'm never bored. Is that? I guess that kind of addresses the question, right? Yeah. I'm never, never bored when I'm hiking. No. Even like if I want to fill the space with anything, sometimes I'll listen to music. Um, but that only, you know, that you can only listen to the same album on repeat for so long yeah. until you just actually, you just want silence. I have to be out in the woods for a really long time before I start getting sick of, uh, birds and crickets and switch to music but i do yeah i do you know like day two day three i start putting on podcasts but usually that first that first eight hours in the woods is my brain just going i wonder if i could get a chicken of my own uh you could you live far enough out in the country i don't think anyone yeah but i rent so i have like rules and crap oh well yeah (laughs) i'm sorry i can't help you i don't know the the renting regulations as they apply to chicken ownership wherever you live. <laughs> you know what? They, it says it says no dogs in the lease, but it does not say no chickens or no goat. So maybe I'm in the <laughs> no <clear>. goat. <laughs> well, no, that's not written in. So I mean, it just says no dogs. So right, why well, couldn't I get a chicken or a goat? If anyone's looking for a way to help support the show, uh, send your chickens to Megan Thompson at. <laughs> um, Somewhere, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I just need a chicken coop out back. <laughs> well, this has been it's a lot of fun. I'm glad that uh, you know. I'm glad that you shared this with us, Griffin. Um, I'm glad that you yes, did it, and I'm you. glad that you you know wanted to share this with us and everyone who listens. So, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you guys. I've had a blast talking to you guys about it, and it's been super helpful to work through some of these ideas too. Well, uh, whether you go back and, you know, try to finish it or start over from the beginning, uh, whatever you do, I hope you call us again, um, even just to hang out if we're not, even if we're not recording, just to, you know, let us know how you're doing. We like you. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. I like you guys, too. Yeah, you're all right. <laughs> stoked on that. Griffin, are you still with us? Right, we may have actually lost Might Griffin. Might have lost him. Yep. I see him on the, on the chat still, but... Uh, Anyway, we've already said goodbye like six times. We should go for real this time. Yeah, we do that yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go finish if you're still watching a movie. Uh, if you're still listening, Katie asked me to ask you to tell your mom and dad that she said hi. So, I don't know <laughs> if you heard that or not. But, uh... you put that on a text message. All right. Okay, I'm going right. to sign off. I'm going to go get some food, and we'll try to talk again in a couple days. Stories from the Trail is a production of thetrek.co. Zach Davis, Editor-in-Chief. Your hosts are me, Gary Sizer, a.k.a. Green Giant, and Megan Thompson, a.k.a. Voldemort. Our music is by Lee Rosevere. 
Don't forget to leave us a five-star review wherever you download the show. And of course, please consider supporting the show by visiting patreon.com slash stories from the trail. The show is recorded, mixed, and edited by me, Gary Sizer, here at Blanket Fort Studios, which is just me in my basement with a blanket over my head. Thanks for listening. That sounds great. So what are you doing these days? Um, <laughs> it's funny. I was just talking to your dad about that this morning. Uh, Katie just left her work and he said, well, someone in that house has got to have a job. <laughs> <laughs> but, um,